Artistic Director of Bunnell Street Art Center, and it's an honor to continue the series Inspiration and Adaptation today with uh, guests in the project of Passages Alaska. Bunnell Street Art Center is situated on Indigenous land, land of Nichilna, Ninilchik Village Tribe, and um, this is land that has been stewarded since time immemorial by the Indigenous people of this region, Denaina Supiak and many others. We're so happy to um, meet you in this space to talk about decolonizing Alaska studies with Jennifer Romer, Ryan Conero, Nita Reardon, and Passages Alaska, the new Alaska studies curriculum springing out of Ping Chong and company theater production, Aluksha, Alaska, developed in collaboration with the Lower Kuskokwim School District. Passages Alaska explores history, contemporary identities of Alaska through multidisciplinary art, storytelling, and theater. So today, I would love to invite um, each of you, um, beginning with Nita, if you're willing, to um, just share a little bit about yourself and your family background, your experiences in education in Alaska. I was born and raised in Catholic Alaska, my grandmother. Nanakukso Teresa Kamarov was my mother until I was six years old. And then she advised me it was time for me to go to school and brought me to my parents. My late parents are Frederick Yugisak and Pauline Ivok Prince, both of Catholic. I was raised among uh, 12 children, uh, lots of siblings. Since I was the oldest daughter, I learned how to be a teacher very young, helping my mother, caring for the siblings. And so I, as school was on for me, I went to a boarding home school, St. Mary's Mission at St. Mary's, Alaska, which prepared me for my college years and went to UAF, got my teaching degree and in 1980, this was after I married my husband and we had two children or three children by then, uh, moved to Bethel and I taught for Lower Kuskokwim School District. And from there, I grew into doing lots of things. I worked in the district office. I also taught up in Kotzebue 90 to 95 and then became, when I went back to Bethel, uh, I worked in the district office as a language specialist and ended with art specialist um, with, the whole, with the whole group. I retired in 2011, but I also do consultant work, um, arts and culture part. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. Thank you, Nita. You have an amazing, um, you know, <laughs> resume and um, an really rich and incredible family background. It's really a privilege to, to work with you, to speak with you today. Welcome. Jennifer Romer, tell us about yourself. So happy to have you with us. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. It's always fabulous to work with this team in any capacity. Um, my name is Jennifer Gnatuk Romer and my um, maternal grandparents are Carol Segura and Don Wright um, of Marshall and Ninana, and my paternal grandparents are um, Albert Romer um, of the Bethel area and Julie Salison of the Bethel area. Um, my parents are Darlene Wright and Richard Romer. And so I had um, different experiences growing up um, in and in my schooling, because I attended urban schools at the beginning of my schooling, but graduated high school out in Bethel. So it was a privilege to work on this project with LKSD. I also had the opportunity to teach out there um, at the high school, even Alaska Studies. So um, 
my other teaching experiences though are pretty broad. I've taught in urban areas like New York City and Washington DC in very large schools, as well as charter schools and rural Alaska. And so I bring a lot of different experiences, which helps to um, gauge some of the work that we do. So I do do some consulting as well. I currently work for Anchorage School District as the K through 12 social studies curriculum coordinator, but I did wanna make it very clear that I'm not representing the district in this capacity right now. Thank you, Jennifer. It's really great to see you in this context and always welcome Ryan Conero. It's so it's been so cool over the years to um, to support your work, um, to watch uh, your you know incredible inclusive spirit make change and and growth for Alaska. Tell us about how you got into um, how you came to you know Alaska and to be in and to become so deeply interested in um, you know doing work through the arts that has been so incredibly uh, transformative. Well, thank you, Asia, and thanks to each of you uh, for inviting me to be a part of this. It's really um, meaningful to, to get to be in conversation with each of you and to work with you. Um, I, uh, beginning at the beginning, um, am originally from North Georgia. Uh, my parents are Pat and Ginny Conero and are both from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my father was a doctor in the U.S. Army, so I grew up um, as an Army brat for much of my upbringing, moving around different parts of the U.S. and uh, finished high school in Georgia. Um, wound up going to uh, school for theater and English at New York University, and it was at the end of that um, of my undergraduate study that I. Um, was lucky enough to um, get to move to Nome, Alaska to work um, at KNOM Radio through the AmeriCorps Volunteer Program. So I was uh, doing features journalism work at KNOM in Nome. And uh, that was, uh, I was 21 when I moved first to Alaska in 2001. And um, it, was, uh, it was really an awesome way to, to get to learn about um, this place, which is, of course, lots of places, not just one, <laughs> um, uh, but to be working in a news department in a small rural community that's also the hub of its region, uh, learning a lot fast about the context. And that's kind of the journey that I'm still on, really. Um, I moved from Nome to, to Juneau and made Juneau home for about 11 years. Um, and from the work in Nome that I was doing wound up really kind of finding uh, the heart of my work being a, as a teaching artist in um, in different schools around Alaska, both in Juneau and Anchorage, as well as in rural communities. Um, I moved to Juneau because uh, I was interested in still working in theater. And of course, there's a theater company in Juneau, Perseverance Theater. So I was just like, let, let me find out about this place and see if I can stay in Alaska, but continue um, to work in the arts. And then slowly started to find out about this really cool program called the Alaska State Council on the Arts, Artists and Schools program. And I was like, hey, I can spend time in rural Alaska and be a theater maker. This is exciting. And uh, just have had so many opportunities to grow and learn by doing in Alaska schools around the state. Um, and it was on that journey that Nita and I first got to meet each other because I was out of the artists and schools program started to work directly with lower Kuskokwim school district um, through their grant funded arts integration program. Um, other experience that uh, came into play included um, three years working with the department of ed, um, their state system of support team. So I was working as a um, education coach going to uh, quote unquote intervention status schools um, and it was really cool that, that for a time the Department of Ed was supporting and putting money behind the idea that uh, arts-based teaching deserves a central place at schools that um, aren't making adequate yearly progress that are really have some fundamental questions they're trying to answer, um, that we don't just need to send math and reading coaches, but we need to send arts-based engagement coaches as well. Um, so I got to learn a lot in those contexts. Um, and from there, 
wound up going to spend several years with uh, the theater company, Ping Chang and Company in New York, um, which does uh, this, you know, community-based arts work. And that's where um, we made the show that led to this conversation, but more on that later. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, it's truly um, an amazing, rich background. You know, I'll say for myself, what brings me to this conversation is that I grew up in Alaska and um, I, I'm the daughter of Carlos and Carla Freeman who came up here to fish and paint and um, build a life from scratch in Homer. And um, growing up, um, my mother was deeply involved in, in radio and she was flying around Alaska meeting um, a lot of culture bearers and elders who were talking about transition and change in Alaska that came with colonization. And, um, and so, you know, their stories echoed throughout my home. And I noticed this tremendous disparity between the kind of experiences I was hearing about at home um, and what I was learning in school. Like, I remember in, in um, third grade, we had a book, it was called From Feathers to Eskimos. And it was the first um, brush with Alaska studies that I guess a student makes in the course of their education, you know, as a requirement um, in elementary school. And then of course, in high school, we have Alaska studies, again, as a graduation requirement. And in that course, um, it really felt like the story we learned began with the conquest of Alaska. And um, it, it was also a story that constantly in reinforced kind of the great white narrative of civilizing Alaska. And it, it was, um, it, it really didn't add up to what I was hearing at home. And I just, it was just a, let's just say that it was an awareness that was lodged in the back of my mind. And then years later, you know, I'm, I'm working um, in presenting arts at Bunnell Street Art Center and amazing projects are coming through, including, um, a kind of movement within the arts of Alaska that's really led by indigenous artists that confronts colonization and starts to tell a more complex and nuanced story of Alaska. And I see it through the art. And then just right coincident with that, you know, the, the project of Alaska, Alaska, the play, which Ping Chang brought to Alaska, um, co-written by Ryan and Gary Upayak Beaver and you know, comes through Homer, Benel presents it. And it's the first time I really felt like we had the opportunity through the stage and through kind of a multidisciplinary um, platform express the value of presenting and discussing a, a truly um, complex and rich and layered story of Alaska as being many different stories. And I think, Ryan, you were the person who um, introduced me to this idea. You put words for something that I knew, that I felt to be true, which is that the story of who we are begins with the stories that we tell ourselves and the stories that we tell and we learn at home, right? And um, that made so much sense to me. And I, and I thought, how can we just like lean into this project? How can, how can mm. more kind of become of it and what, what can happen? And then, you know, I get distracted and excited by Benel work, but within a year or two, you reached out about this curriculum project. And so mm -hmm. before we go into that though, I wanna step back and ask each of you in your experiences of Alaska schools, what particular challenges or opportunities did you encounter in terms of how Alaska schools have been teaching Alaska studies or Alaska history that suggested to you the need for a new approach? And if I might invite Nita to start us out there, like if, if I know it's a really big question, but what, 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 what did you see that made, you know, in a sense, you drawn to the, this project? Well, I would say when I took Alaskan history classes in high school <clears throat> and world, world history classes, I didn't like them. I, I had no interest in them, but I know these were 
required courses that I had to pass. So the curriculum that I know is usually written by someone else's collections of uh, knowledge. So the classes I took were like, I had to read the chapters, um, answer the questions at the end of the chapters, and I memorized many dates and events. And there was no connections of me to these chapters, but it was all by rote memory before tests uh, in order to pass everything that we remembered. And so I, I think that's what I remember of all the history classes and I always told myself I never liked them at all until I remember um, my husband was down in Georgia for um, law enforcement training. He was hired for Fish and Wildlife uh, sir, uh, Service. And he asked me to come down and see, hey, you should come down. This is so totally different in Georgia. So I did. Mm -hmm. I traveled to Georgia. And when we went um, like tourists, we went to visit the homes and historical background of things. I saw when during World War II or when um, the blue, blue colors, you know, their homes, displaying of their homes, man, these were little people. Um, that got me thinking, wow, history would have made sense if I ever saw it before I took the class. If I had toured in places where World War II happened or um, uh, other war stories that had happened, history would have made sense and I would have remembered 1800s much more better with those kind of experiences. And that was thoughts. But in up here, it was all memory and I don't remember anything. <laughs> So you really connected to, to the, the experience of touring places, almost like theater in a sense. It brought to life with people like populating yeah. those spaces and places to help you. Yeah, that resonates for me too, because I think when I absorbed anything, it was by being able to um, make a map of Alaska, you know, to draw it or to, um, you know, feel materials and, th and think about like, how are these materials used? So, but those connections were, were really hard to come by. Like I would have to convince my teachers that that's, that's the kind of project I wanted to do. <laughs> you know, they were like, you got to know these dates. <laughs> so I, I really, that resonates for me. What about you, Jen? What was your experience like, you know, growing up in Alaska, the kinds of um, challenges or opportunities you saw for um, new, new possibilities for how we might teach or learn Alaska? Okay. Well, I think if I think back to elementary or K through 12 education, um, I grew up um, in the Matsu and Kenai and Anchorage. So there weren't a lot of native students in my classes. I don't think, yeah, I, especially um, very early on in elementary. And I feel like oftentimes in social studies, indigenous people were kind of talked about like, like we're like we've been conquered and we're in the past, right? That we're not here living now, that we don't, uh, that our culture is not dynamic like other cultures. Um, and I think I can really identify with what Nita said because they taught history in a chronological order that seemed to just want you to memorize people um, and dates. And, um, you know, I think that really shaped my um, philosophy as an educator, um, because I think it's so important to contextualize um, for students and you, you can teach history thematically. It doesn't have to be chronological. And I think that's what makes it so boring for students because it's never drawn back to their own personal experiences. And I think for me, because both sides of my family are very, were very and have been very involved in native politics, like it was very common at uh, like we watched the news together and talked about it even when I was very young and we talked about really in-depth 
and political things. And we were modeled by our family how to, how to critically analyze. And I think that's really important because we're missing out if we're just having kids memorize and not, not engage in critical analysis where they're able to challenge and feel successful challenging what's what's being what they're being told to read what they're hearing in lectures um, and I think the other thing that I really identify with is the field trip it's important to be out in the community and engage with with community members um, because that's how we promote civic civic duty and civic mindedness and willingness to contribute and have our communities grow because of the diversity. That's what I really appreciate about Alaksha Alaska because it's all these different stories. And um, when I was able to be involved with facilitating the community discussions after the play per performances here in Anchorage, it was so powerful because everybody had different stories and it was a safe place to be able to engage in those stories and feel like we could have discourse even if our experiences weren't the same because that's something we're really missing right now um, just as a, as a society is that we're not engaging in proper respectful discourse to learn from one another and teach one another. So, um, there's just so many things you can do if you get out of that, read the chapter, answer the questions at the end, memorize it for a multiple choice test. And I think it's so important to um, have interdisciplinary lessons where we're engaging the arts, where we're engaging reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills so that everybody feels like they have a voice and that their story matters. I just, I mean, to, to hear you speak about it, you know, with, with such clarity and articulation, I, I just think I want your perspective to be broadcast and cultivated all over Alaska. It's so, it's so right on. And I'm, and I, I'm so glad that you are so deeply involved with the school district and at the same time, really committed to these kind of grassroots ways in, in a project, in, in a conversation, facilitation, post you know, performance with Alexka and then in curriculum writing, I, your um, commitment to doing this work as best as possible for students is so clear, Jen. It's, it's really Thank inspiring. You. Brian, how, um, you know, at working as an artist in schools and spending a lot of time in rural Alaska, you must have um, had some pretty intense experiences informed, informed by, you know, both like your own background and insight in theater, but also just the um, the kind of, you know, I, I know you to be like a, a really receptive and porous person who's collecting stories, who's listening earnestly. And um, what did you see that made you think this kind of a play, a play about the, the you know, different complex ways we can tell the story of Alaska um, and then, later to develop a curriculum. How did you, how did you get into that? Hmm. Um, I think that when I, I guess, I guess one place I could start is to say, you know, I, I, as I mentioned before, came out of undergrad theater school and in, in to working in radio in rural Alaska and have grown, I think for me to, to, to articulate my, my life's work and my artistic practice as um, a practice of story sharing to, to sort of zoom out beyond it, certainly theater making is a part of that, but um, that it's that that what's fundamentally important to me about theater making is about the story sharing and the, the kinds of things that you both articulated Nita and Jen and that that can happen in different different ways. Um, so it's about um, making space for that. Um, when I first, I, I thought I might share my memory of my first, it's an embarrassing memory, of my first artists in schools residency through the State Arts Council. I had recently moved to Juneau, again, learned about this artists in schools opportunity, and that spring uh, went to Chivac schools and did a, a K-12 school residency. Um, and that was my first experience of many after that 
through the artisan schools program where, you know, the, the, the teacher, the educator who was managing their grant on the ground, you know, secu like we secured, we secured a plan. They, or they booked me basically. And then they were like, okay, come do your thing. And I was kind of like, cool. What, like, what, are, what's the project? What do we want to do? And they're like, well, just do your theater thing. Like whatever you do, come do it. And I, I came to become familiar with this feeling, but at the time I was like, well, what's happening in Chivac? What's happening at the school? Like, what's the context? Um, and I understand, I, I came to realize like as a teacher that first of all, kudos to any teacher who's taking the time to, to be the person facilitating these opportunities for students because it's extra work. But um, I could imagine being in that person's shoes and be like, great, we got it all lined up. We're done. He's coming this date. But for me, it was like, we're just begun. Like, I want to do something that feels meaningful and relevant. And that question of relevancy became really important and still feels really important to me because I, the embarrassing part of the story is that I um, planned a residency that was all built around <laughs> Shel Silverstein poetry. <laughs> and I just did a Shel Silverstein show, which, you know, hopefully wasn't bad, but um, I'm not sure that it was very relevant. In fact, the, the most embarrassing part is that I realized that um, th that I had planned the, the, the spine of the performance event to be the story, the giving tree. And then the students pointed out to me that there are no trees in that region. <laughs> uh, so we've heard this story time and again with educators who uh, come from outside to, to Alaska and, and that's the position that I arrived at. So it helped me to continue to think about, uh, to be able to remember from my own experience, what's it like to be in those shoes and how do we um, invite people who are in those shoes to, to come on a journey and recognize we are the ones who have the learning to do. We're the ones who have the learning to do. Um, and like any systemic challenge, there's not a person or a position in school systems from state all the way down to the school building that is responsible for why it is like it is and has the full power to change it. We need that kind of change and shift to be happening on all levels at once. And it does take sometimes me saying, oh, I need to step back and realize I need to do some learning. So for me, um, slowly, slowly realizing, wow, like there's, you know, what is, if we're talking about Alaska studies in Alaska, it's everything, it's anything. Like it's, we, how can we integrate this? The, to say it's all in basically. And the stories of this community are the most important thing in this community. And yet we have high school students, especially as they get older, trying to fulfill these credit requirements that move further and further away from that sense of this place is the most important place in my life and in my community. And this implicit message that to succeed um, beyond high school means to leave, means to, be, to go away from this place. Um, that's not always the best for every student. So, uh, I will say that, um, you know, I started focusing on doing place based artists in schools residencies that were interview based. I really like sitting down for conversation and it was fun to learn to, to guide students to do the same. And I felt like it was a privilege as a teaching artist to be in a school in the system for a short time, but also not sort of beholden to some of the things that I know teachers and administrators are sometimes stuck having to answer to. Um, to be able to say, I have some freedom and flexibility. So for these two weeks, we're going to do an interview based project about community members here. And hopefully that can make a little dent in some of the um, challenges that are here. And it was um, when I went to Ping Chong and Company in New York um, in 2014 through a grant funded residency. Um, honestly, it was it was really it was I have to credit Ping, the artistic director of the company for the idea of making the show Alakshka Alaska, um, because he was the one who said, well, you just came from there, like, let's do a show about that place. And I said, well, I don't know that I'm the person to do that, but perhaps we could start to put together a team to explore the questions that I always wrestle with about what is my role and place here. And even that, I think sometimes is an example, like Ping as an outsider to my experience, it took him some time, it took him in that moment to say, you you could you could talk about this in this forum make a show about it and it could be useful i don't think i would have done it without him because i i think I, I, it took him from outside of my shoes to to show me um so that position of the outsider can sometimes be a useful thing too uh, so that's kind of how that's kind of what led 
to the theater production, which then led to this curriculum. Mm -hmm. So Alakshka, Alaska is a theatrical collage of multimedia puppetry, central Yupik drum, dance, illuminating striking moments of cross-cultural cross encounter, an epic and changing landscape of Alaska. It's a beautiful theater piece, um, which has been performed around Alaska. You must have had, was it like a, a two-year run, a tour that took you from Kasigluk to, to Fairbanks, Anchorage, Homer, Soldovia, um, <laughs> Wallach, I mean, yeah, it was, it was remarkable. And I think um, the thing for me that resonated so much is the earnest and vulnerable way in which um, you ask the question as, as a white man, as a Kasuk coming to Alaska, what, you know, what is my role here? And it resonated for me also as a white person, but a person who was learning from Alaska studies, often from teachers who were new to Alaska. And I've learned that Alaska studies ends up being a course that a lot of the newest teachers are asked to teach. And, and that on one hand seems so preposterous, but it also seems like a real opportunity because the way mm. that the uh, Passages Alaska curriculum explores that, and I'm really excited to, to talk about that next, is through the question of engaging curiosity, engaging interview, and asking what is the relationship to this place from a long time indigenous perspective, from an elder, a, you know, who a child might be interviewing their own self-reflection on that role. And then, you know, whoever the self is in this inquiry, which is teacher and students of all colors is really to ask those questions, those reflexive questions. So um, yes, can we dive in, Ryan? Can I invite you to um, maybe share some lessons and we could we can all, I hope, you know, chime in and talk about what really, um, inspired you know us in the creation of these lessons and um, talk about what really distinguishes this new curriculum in method and content from you know other kinds of uh, curriculum on Alaska studies that have come before. I would love to start that conversation and, and maybe I'll share a few things. Um, Asia, would you mind making me able to share my screen? Yes, I should have done that a while ago. And um, of course, Asia, Nita, Jen, please just jump in and interject uh, if you if I'm missing something or you want to throw something in. And also, I'll be seeing I won't be seeing you as well while I share screen. So don't hesitate to interrupt me, please. Um, You're officially a co-host. So. OK, cool. Thank you. Uh, I'll as a visual aid, I'll just share a few glimpses of uh, of this uh, curriculum. And the, these three folks and I have been the core team creating the curriculum. and. I just want to emphasize what a blast it's been and how much I've learned um, from each of you. So thank you. Um, Passages Alaska, as Asia shared, it's an arts integrated Alaska studies course, exploring the stories, histories, cultures, and contemporary identities of Alaska rooted in Ping Chong and Company's theatrical production, Alakshka Alaska, and integrated with interdisciplinary arts engagements. Um, I, I would say that Alaska, Alaska, uh, I'm sorry, with Passages Alaska, the, the curriculum, that we designed this together to begin with this question of identities. And we chose the plural on purpose, um, acknowledging the plurality that there's, that there's so many different identities coming into this room, this classroom where we're studying together. And that unit one, as you can see here, is asking the question, who am I and who are you? And that sort of explores the idea that that's where history comes from and how history is made. I think one, one uh, value of this is that we are Alaska history in this classroom, that it's, it's alive and it's uh, continuing forward. Uh, so each, uh, each week basically is a unit in the course or each unit is a week if you're thinking about a typical uh, semester term. Um, and each week is structured with uh, essential questions like who am I and who are you, and then an arts integration focus. In this case, we use uh, uh, an arts process that Ping Chong and company taught me and uses regularly called River Story. 
Um, so you can see in this lesson that the first day of, or this unit, the first lesson of the unit is Alaska as a river of stories. And it um, is using the metaphor of a river to explore both historical and contemporary stories and say it's really all rooted in that. That is where we're going. That's the message we try to send to students in that first unit. Um, other units uh, include, I'm going to share a glimpse of um, unit three, which is exploring both uh, Seward's folly and statehood. Um, you can see this lesson in unit three is called satire and statehood, and it's headed towards an arts project where students create their own political cartoons. Um, exploring Alaska's politics. And the reason I wanted to point this out is because it's both looking at history, but it's also always referring back to the production of Alaska, Alaska, with, which uses political cartoons in its video projections. So as the students go through the course, every week they witness one or more scenes from the play as a video. And the play carries the students and the teacher through these moments of Alaska history, these moments of personal storytelling and these glimpses of art forms so that then they can respond to that history by learning a little bit about that art form and making uh, an art piece themselves. Um, I'll just show two more. Unit seven. Um, unit seven is called uh, America's Warehouse Resources in Alaska. And um, America's Warehouse is, of course, a quotation from Governor Dunleavy speaking about Alaska as a resource rich state. And it's a, that's a moment of history, the fact that he said that. And we asked students to look critically at, at, at that label for this place. And in that project, we invite students to create social media activist images where they're expressing their perspective on resource extraction and sustainability in Alaska. And then lastly, um, you know, the, the history of epidemics is, is such a really important part of an impactful part of Alaska history. Um, so we felt it important to, um, to link to that historical study, um, some exploration of what, what is epidemic and pandemic, how is that shaping our lives now in Alaska? Um, and so we look at these campaigns that have been contemporary around COVID and vaccination, and then invite students to make artistic work responding to that. Um, so in a way, uh, we're bouncing back and forth in each unit between history and what does it mean to me now and how do I respond to that artistically um, through arts instruction. Oh, it's so that's, great. yeah. It's so great. I, I wonder, can we go back to River Stories, um, to that amazing image um, of flying in, you know, over the Yukon, Cuscoquim Delta, and um, I wonder, um, you know, so this is, uh, of course, an incredible metaphor for the many different stories and the way that they eddy and mingle, you know, in a classroom um, as um, peoples of, of um, you know, a variety of backgrounds. And let's, can we, can we peek into the River Story lesson a little bit and talk about um, the kinds of things we're inviting um, teachers to ask the students and the types of things they get to create? Absolutely. I need to remember um, which lesson we're in the unit of River Stories, and I'm not sure which lesson that um, the actual activity begins. Oh, right. Um, yeah, I should remember myself, but uh, I'll scroll through it. And it's a glimpse of, you know, even just the structure of the, the, the each unit. Uh, we have some visual aids. I should mention this is an image of um, Josie Stiles in Nome, Alaska, who shared her story in her image for the making of Alushka, Alaska. And we created this accompanying web website, encountersalaska.org, which is a place for the stories that were shared in the making of the show to be sort of lived and archived beyond just inside the theater production. Um, so that's another resource that the, the curriculum uses. Forgive my scrolling. No, it's such a great resource because it's a place where you can find interviews if you had a difficult time, say, finding interview subjects like your elders or you know community members. There's all those wonderful interviews that are archived there for people. To I should say, since we're talking about the website, that I happen to know from folks at Ping Chong and Company just okay. earlier this week that they have taken that site down and are to do some admin work. So if you're listening right now and you're like, let me go to encountersalaska.org, you will see that it is not there, but it's coming back. So don't <laughs> fret. <laughs> um, but I did find 
here, Asia, that, that, that piece of this unit in which the river story itself is uh, guided for teachers. Yeah. And, you know, Nita, you, you know, having been an art teacher for many years and created, you know, some really quite famous kits to help students, um, you know, explore and, and process um, through customary art forms, um, experiences of Alaska to learn, you know, material processes, but also um, cultural processes. When you think about this particular lesson and as, as a teacher, um, how does it, you know, how does it feel different or new? What kind of um, opportunities excite you about how different kinds of students could get excited about this? Definitely connecting the kids to their environment. Um, in Alaska, we have two huge rivers, Yukon and Kuskokwim. And what floats down the river, the resources we use from the river, um, many of these things that happen for our kids who are connected to their land, the water, and um, that was really definitely one of the things that the kids could talk about using their own background knowledge and what resources that they have. Uh, connections, the cultural, the Yupik, we use the Yupik for LKSD, but it could be any other um, uh, indigenous groups, you know, if it was taught in different uh, area uh, regions. And so I really thought connecting the kids to their right background yard and uh, them, that was one of the best comments that I heard from the teachers that these kids were really connected to who they were and how they, um, how it was taught, a lot of it was a lot of stuff that was locally connected. And the teachers really enjoyed that part when we interviewed them, Mike and uh, when we went to Nabaskiak, that part with the kids was like a life. Kids were able to uh, talk about it, make references, discuss it, interested, and uh, wanted to do more interviews and they wanted to um, the express themselves in uh, the, the uh, art stuff, you know, their voice, their imaginations, using their imaginations. And many of them just loved uh, the idea of creating yuhak, dancing. They really enjoyed that part. Any of these, because it was through the stories. The dances were uh, created through, they, I think they could have created dances through every unit, you know, if that was allowed, they can. They so just love the Yorok part to really express themselves of who they really are. Yeah. And so it's, it's really awesome. interesting. I was glad, um, Ryan included a lot of the Yupik uh, cultural background and then the arts. Um, and I don't remember which, which art, uh, origins of the Yupik colors through masks. And I don't remember which unit that one mm -hmm. was, but the kids were, even the teachers, um, they were expressing that uh, somehow because kids could relate it to these, uh, to them, to their own culture, what they expressed was, it was great. You know, they enjoyed it. They enjoyed doing it and learning, also really learning of their own culture, of their connections and interviews with the elders um, or even their own community. It, it looked like uh, the whole stories became alive. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, by connecting to them. So, so I fantastic. think they could produce a wonderful play themselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. If I may, I'll just share a glimpse on that topic um, that in the beginnings of each unit and some of the lessons within the units, we, we incorporate as best we can uh, context like what Nita has just shared and a lot of our process this group of four was sharing these bits of context and then saying some of this should be shared with teachers who are leading this course. 
So uh, we offer, you know, from Nida for, in this section, um, description of the rivers of the region. Um, we offer some language and vocabulary. Um, this is the first unit of the of the course. So some some fundamental basics about cultural background, um, and also as part of some of these Yupik terms, um, there's a there's a, a pronunciation guide for uh, some audio recordings uh, where Nita is sharing the pronunciation of these words for teachers who want to share them with students. Um, so recognizing what we said before that. Uh, many times this course is taught by teachers new to the state, uh, trying to offer them what we can. Yeah, but it was also an opportunity if you're new to get to know the local people using this course of how, how the learning took place was two way street. A lot of it was both ways there. New teachers were learning from local people versus them learning from the teachers mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah, yeah, such a great, you know, thought. I I think to to empower the new teacher to to sort of join the students in the process of inquiry. You know. Yes. And, yeah. and I know. think that cross cultural exchange is so important, but also thinking about cultural identity and how it relates to how we walk through the world, and pointing out the nuances that could be different between like a Western worldview and an indigenous worldview. And when we think about cultural identity for students, as well as educators, that facilitation is important to look at self because we all walk through our cultural identity at, at different paces. And we're not, in, we're not in the same place, even as indigenous people and our family experiences and the experiences that we've had um, in the places that we come from. And that's why this place-based education is so important because it allows you to um, to recognize that you're constantly growing and that your cultural identity and your worldview impact the decisions you make working in the community, working in your job, uh, when you vote, <laughs> and how resources, you know, how we have to have that respect for land. Um, in order to make decisions that that these students will make once they're of voting age, you know, and how that interaction can teach um, people from outside Alaska that are moving because it is typically what's going to happen is they're going to be the ones teaching these courses. Um, and, you know, having that back and forth exchange of knowledge, but coming from your own safe place where where you're at in your own cultural identity but recognizing that we are living history it's not something that happened in the past because things that happened during colonization are impacting us today in the way we think um, and how um, we interact with others in what we do within our communities so understanding that once you start with self and then you're able to look at a bigger picture that you recognize the importance of engaging with one another in community when we are different and why that's so important because we'll learn from one another and it's constantly um, changing that we're living history, um, the impact that it can have and the respect that we can have for one another in those cross-cultural exchanges. Think about students, you know, really as um, students might perceive themselves as learners, but this curriculum um, empowers them as writers and creators of the story of Alaska. That they're taking notes and they're reflecting back and they're making works that contribute to that story and their own particular stories that are really important. And by strengthening that cultural identity, it empowers students to be able to go out into the world and know that they can always come back home. And when they have that strong cultural identity, then they're able to um, maneuver in other areas of the world um, in a stronger way because they have that connection um, to be able to teach others out there. You know, I think of my time spent on the East Coast and how much people engaging in just regular conversation when you meet people, how much they're able to learn about 
Alaska and indigenous people because they don't have that exposure at a regular basis coming from indigenous people. They've always read about indigenous people or like they're in the past instead of recognizing that worst, you know, because I've had in my travels, I've had people actually look at me and tell me that I wasn't native because they think that native people are extinct. I've had people literally think that. So they think I'm something different. And so in order to have those engagements where we learn from one another, you have to have that strong sense of cultural identity. One of the most exciting um, and powerful things that I feel like we explored in this curriculum are different ways in which an Indigenous person becomes a real person in the community, you know, by becoming Nipokiak, by becoming a hunter, for example. Could we talk a little bit about how um, the sharing of those terms and the opportunity to validate um, identities from a more traditional perspective is really transformative? to how a teacher might see what a student needs to do in a given week or in a given day if there's a hunt happening or how a student might be able to um, you know feel honored in the work that they need to do for their families or their community i just i wanted to acknowledge that this curriculum really um through you know through work that each of you brought to this you know elevates the real lives of people around Alaska? Well, I think it's important to value, like within our indigenous culture, we, um, you know, throughout generations and generations, people came with different strengths that tied to what they um, gave to their community or tribe. So like some people are orators, right? And other people are hunters. And so having this in interdisciplinary approach allows students to tap into their own cultural strengths and learn how to um, express themselves. You know, if someone's a strong hunter, they're gonna have to have that place-based engagement with the land and they're probably gonna wanna do more tactile things. Um, you know, whereas if you're an orator, you're gonna wanna be able to tell your story in different modalities um, so that you can share it with other people within the community, recognizing that in our culture, we all bring strengths that contribute to the success of families and community. That's right. And success all... is measured differently in, mm -hmm. in uh, Ayupik. For a Nugashbak, that successful hunter, if they become, in order to become a Nugashbak, you would have to learn the skills of um, hunting skills and knowing the weather and where to go in order to bring some food uh, home, uh, catching a big game or a mammal from the ocean. And then you are successful in that part where, you know, a village will recognize you as a Nugashbak. You've graduated from a child to a man. And then that man, and then respect for that Nugashbak because of what they brought home is um, measured and respected for him the rest of his life. But in Western world, success to, uh, to them, it means that we have to graduate from high school or go get a job or go on, go on to the uh, college life to be successful, to come back and acquire a job. So if we measure these small little successes under the history of the indigenous people, imagine more successes that the students can have at later time. Mm -hmm. If we want them to finish school, it will be, they'll get there. And if they need to go into a trade school or um, continue their education and higher ed, they'll get there. But they have to measure themselves first of who they are. To make that measurement, it has to be a very successful in the cultural content. Um, whether you become a good seamster, a very good seamster, or um, Nugashbak is one, another one for boys. 
and also um, skilled, becoming a very skillful in the arts, cultural arts, being able to do, we call that person as one who successfully could become very skilled in an area. And so those are measured as successful of who they really are and how we measure them when they leave, when they have their cultural foundation, if they're able to go to a larger cities and survive mm -hmm. by knowing who they are. And I know elders will say, okay, if I let my son go, he'll be fine. If when he's able to come back to, and so, Anyway, those kind of things really resonate while I think uh, by watching the kids when um, Ryan and I went back in December, very cold weather, <laughs> it was so fun to watch the kids, how successful that they were in by taking this course. It was almost at the end of the classes, like it was time to celebrate who you are. Yeah. yeah. It was almost like that to me to celebrate them of who they really are in completing the coursework. Yeah. So you're speaking about the fact that this curriculum was tested, was tried and tested in the LKSD, Lower Cusclum School District this last fall. And um, mm -hmm. you went back um, to Bethel and, and were, you were able to speak with teachers and, and look at, um, as you say, you know, like the, the experience to reflect on the experience. And I, I'm really excited to hear your impressions about that. You say it was really a celebration. The biggest celebrations of the students was that they really wanted to meet these actors. <laughs> Dustin <laughs> and Gary and Ryan, they says, that's who you are. Can you say, <laughs> remember the lines? They, they remember the lines, what went on. Dustin was what, do you remember, Ryan? Oh, uh, there's a repeated line that Justin Perkins in the, sh in the yeah. show, Alaska Alaska says, that's progress. And he's sort of poking fun <laughs> at the idea of progress in history and colonization. And the students definitely keyed into that repeat, repeated phrase and said, will you say it live? <laughs> <laughs> they really want to have the truth of them to do these little parts that they remembered from the videos. It was so cool. <laughs> yeah, the connections to the, um, not, it wasn't just a video that they could watch, but they really connected what ex they knew exactly parts that they played in the uh, throughout the whole lessons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think the idea behind showing them snippets instead of the entire play at once allows them to take it to a deeper level and really make those stronger connections because they're, because it's a lot to take in when you watch the whole thing. And so it allows <laughs> adolescents to just take it in pieces and then they can choose to go back and watch the entire thing together and have a stronger and deeper understanding of um, the power behind the stories that are told and the history and the impact that it, it has on today. Yeah. Teachers did have some challenging to them. You know, some of them don't know how to teach monologue or uh, how to do those parts. Different sections of the arts was really hard on them. And I think if they get any help from the artist or inviting others, it might work out a lot better. So it did, was- Did that happen? The teachers sort of, suggested maybe an interdisciplinary approach to teaching, like, you know, bringing in, you know, an art teacher, or as you say, people from the community who know that customary art form, for example, and sort of open up the classroom? I think that's going to come up again. If they had to do reteach it, you know, they will be better prepared of who to reach out for. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, one, one thing that we heard when we were in Bethel uh, in, in the Pasquiac in December um, was both that the teachers who piloted the course, um, 
you know, wanted to do that, first of all. And so they were, they were people who were motivated to explore new ways of teaching Alaska studies and were really excited about the tools that the curriculum offers. And as you said, Nita, and you know, I, the, I would, there would be some, because the, P, the curriculum is interdisciplinary, each unit is a different art form. And so there are some that I, if I were teaching, I'd be like, cool, got it. And then there'd be others where I was like, whoa, I'm teaching visual art now. I'm not a visual artist. This is out of my box. And our hope is that we can do our best to provide teachers um, in the curriculum itself with the tools. They can use the videos of the show as a model. Um, we can encourage them up, down, left and right in writing to bring guests in, please bring guests and take advantage of the resources of your community. Recognize that Alaska Studies is here right now and those, those folks are just outside the walls or maybe just on the other next classroom over. Um, but then also at the same time that, you know, teachers will, uh, will say yes to it and um, you know, make themselves a little vulnerable to, to step into their student's shoes and say, I'm going to try it too. And we're going to, we're going to learn together and take risks together. And that's, that's when we're really somewhere, I think. Yeah. yeah. So Ryan, tell us, you know, like where the curriculum is at now in terms of its accessibility to, um, Alaska schools, teachers across Alaska, what, when will that, um, be possible for me to, you know, for example, <laughs> Yeah, sure. No, it's really exciting. And, and there's been, I think we've all four of us and other people on the project have had a lot of enthusiastic questions about exactly that. Um, and we, I, I think we all want to really shout out um, both Ping Chong and Company and Lower Kuskokum School District for supporting this to the point that it's arrived at so far. Um, Ping Chong and Company has still been uh, supporting the administration and the details of the logistics of things like our writing retreats and our uh, gathering in Bethel. And then LKSD uh, came forward about a year ago, I think, and said, hey, we'd like to support um, seeing this through and piloting the course. Um, so with that in mind, the course pilot just finished in December. Um, and the purpose for Nita and me to be there, along with Gary Beaver and Justin Perkins, was to visit classes, as we talked about, and also to the heart of our week was to sit down with the teachers who've been teaching the class and get their feedback and get feedback from students as well. Um, so next, uh, we'll have a period of revision. Um, and then my understanding is that um, LKSD administrators will uh, take it forward uh, to ask um, as long uh, once I should I shouldn't say will LKSD, I believe, as if they approve of the new draft will put it forward to their, their board um, to adopt. And if it passes that, then it will become like, you know, a credit bearing course for teachers to choose to use as the Alaska Studies course moving forward. And at that point, we will be able to talk about like, okay, how does this get shared as a resource for other teachers and other school districts as well. So to be concrete about it, um, maybe a year from now, I think, if I guess correctly, we'll be able to, LKSD will be further along in that process and we'll be able to start talking about sharing it with other folks. I'm so excited for that moment when I can tell teachers <laughs> around Alaska that it's available. And um, I just wanna thank you all so much for the work that you've done to make this, to build this curriculum. Good, thank you, Aza. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you for the rich conversation. Thank you. Take care and be well.